They come in a slightly larger package, like this one, um, or let me show you a different one. This one. This one is another a typical one at one megahertz. Also very popular. Again, four pins can be used on a, on a breadboard or on a, a PCB. So these guys, um, these are the most basic type of crystal oscillators you can get. But you can do things that are more fancy, meaning that you could build oscillators that have uh, features to account for drift, to account for temperature variation. They could have shock absorbance built into them. So there's a lot of other fancy things you can do. Or you can get this in surface mount. So here I have the PCB of a, a cell phone that's a few generations old, maybe about five years old. And on this board alone, has a, there's a whole bunch of stuff here. There's a, the, the processor from Qualcomm. There's some memory. There's uh, some uh, amplifiers that connect to the antenna. But even on this, I can see one, two, three, four, five, at least five oscillators on this one board alone. And you can imagine there's, uh, there's going to be just as many, if not more, in the modern, on a modern cell phone. So you can see how popular these things are and how necessary they are for pretty much any system that requires timekeeping. So what I've done is that I have put one of these oscillators on a little breadboard, like this one. This is a 4 megahertz, very basic crystal oscillator. I've connected it up, so I want to power this on and look at the signal that it generates. What I've also done is that I've also made my own little oscillator, which we will talk about afterwards. So let's power this on and measure it. So I've decided to actually talk about this oscillator also before we do any measurements because it would make it easier then to do some comparison there on the spot. So this oscillator that I've built is a very simple ring oscillator which consists of three inverters in a row. So what does that look like? It looks like this. I have taken a, a single CMOS inverter followed by another one followed by a third one and fed back the output all the way to the input and here's my output. So what does this do? Well this configuration of inverters because all of these guys have negative gain so basically if, there's, if I put a 1 here a 0 appears here and if I put a 0 here a 1 appears here and if I put a 1 here a 0 appears here but this 0 is in conflict with this input meaning that this system is actually unstable and it meets the bar counts and criteria for oscillation and all that stuff that I don't want to get into too much of the theory and the way this oscillates is that every one of these inverters has a propagation delay it means that when I put a 1 at the input of the inverter a 0 doesn't appear at the output instantaneously it takes some time before this 1 translates into a 0 at the output and that's a, a propagation delay through this inverter each of them have a propagation delay through them. So if this is a startup position and the zero arrives at the input, by the time this one becomes this zero becomes a one again and goes all the way to the output, it will take some time, which is TP plus TP plus TP. So this guy will oscillate, producing a approximately a square wave at its output, whose period is proportional to the delay through these inverters. So that's all I've built. And the way I've, the way I've built this is using MOS transistors. This particular uh, chip that I'm using has a whole bunch of NMOS and PMOS transistors in it and I've wired them up in this configuration. And of course a, a CMOS inverter is the most uh, basic uh, CMOS component you can build. It just looks like this. Okay, so here's one inverter in the corner of draw. So I put three of them in a row and that's the fastest oscillation frequency I can possibly get out of this chip because it has no extra, I have added no extra capacitance and no extra time constants to it so it's, it's going to oscillate as fast as this chip, this technology would allow and the propagation delay is a function of VDD, is a function of the capacitance in the circuit and a function of technology parameters like W and L and mu n and C arcs and so on. And if you have some CMOS background you can read up on that and also if you guys are interested for me to go into more uh, theoretical detail for this kind of stuff please let me know uh, because I'm kind of reserving uh, those type of topics for uh, 
a very theoretical tutorials which would be used for analog and digital design. But for now, just a quick um, overview of how this oscillator is built. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to now uh, power both of these on and compare and look at the outputs on the oscilloscope and then we can see the frequency of oscillation and then we can begin to see uh, the differences between them. So let's do that. Okay, we are ready to do some measurements. So I have the circuit here again. I'm going to be using for the first measurement um, uh, instruments to look at the signal in the time domain. So first take a look and see what the frequency coming out of these two circuits look like versus time. To do that, you need of course a power supply. I'm going to be using the Regal DP1116A. I've just received these two new power supplies and there's going to be a product review for these guys coming up. Really incredible units, so please check back so you can see uh, what these guys are capable of. So I will use this one, turn it on. Uh, it's going to boot up. And I'm going to be using this portable Tektronix TDS210 uh, oscilloscope just so we can get a quick idea of what the waveforms look like. So let's, uh, let's focus here and see uh, what we're doing. So here's the power supply. I'm going to set it to uh, 10 volt mode, give it 5 volts, and I'm going to connect um, the positive terminal to the circuit. So I'm doing that right now. The negative terminal also to the circuit, like so and I'm going to enable the output of the power supply. So it says uh, 4.999, which is 5 volts, um, 24 milliamps of, uh, 23 milliamps of uh, power consumption, and which is 120 uh, milliwatts. So now the circuit is powered on. I'm going to go back so you can see that the circuit is connected through the cables from the power supply. And then I will connect the uh, channel 1 of the oscilloscope to the crystal oscillator's output. So that's straightforward, connecting it like so. And I will connect the ground signal to ground. And I will connect channel 2 of the oscilloscope to the output of my circuit, the little ring oscillator that's connected. I will also connect the ground as well. So now the whole thing is connected, like so and make sure the cables are not so messy. And now let's look and focus on what the um, oscilloscope is saying. Let's see if I can get this as nicely as possible. Oh, here we go. Move it a little bit closer. Here it is. Okay, so right now at the top, I have the output of channel one. At the bottom is the output of channel 2. So channel 1 is a score wave coming from our 4 MHz crystal oscillator. I can do some measurements. I can go measure and it says the frequency is 4 MHz and the amplitude peak to peak of channel 1 is 4.8 uh, volts, uh, 4.88 volts, which makes sense because we're using a 5 volt power supply. Now, the signal at the bottom is coming from the ring oscillator it looks all uh, messy moving back and forth and the reason is because the frequency of the crystal and the frequency of my ring oscillator are not multiples of each other so therefore the edges, the, the uh, triggering an edge of one does not correspond to a repetitive uh, triggering of the edge of the second signal so because their frequency are just a little bit different and they're arbitrarily different so what I have to do in order for to see this signal nicely is I would have to trigger on the second channel right now the trigger if I go to the trigger menu the trigger is set to source channel 1 if I change the source to channel 2 I will see this signal now stable while this signal is moving back and forth. So this allows me to look at the second one now. Now this signal does not look like a square wave as much as the first one does. And the reason is because there are frequency limitations in the, in the circuit that doesn't allow those nice sharp edges that you see from a square wave. Of course, an ideal square wave has frequency content all the way to infinity if you take the Fourier transform of a, um, a periodic square wave signal. So you can see that this, uh, although it doesn't really matter because uh, uh, this is still an oscillator producing a periodic signal and I can look at the amplitude and the frequency of this one as well, clicking measure. So channel 2 frequency 3.98 uh, megahertz or so. So it's very close to the crystal oscillator. So I purposely chose the crystal oscillator 
frequency to be very close to this one so we can do a fair comparison. So they're both really close to 4 megahertz and the swing is also about 5 volts and not surprising because we are uh, biasing and the inverters that make up the ring oscillator from a 5 volt power supply as well. Now if you look at this signal and then compare it to the other signal we don't really see much of a difference. They both look like nice, periodic, um, don't, don't look like they have much noise on them, they look fairly stable, but in reality there's a big difference between the quality of this signal and the quality of this signal when frequency, um, uh, spectral purity, uh, frequency drift, temperature effect, effects are concerned. So I like to measure some of those differences, but can't really do them on this instrument really well. So we're going to move on to a different instrument and see how uh, these signals look in the frequency domain and then see the differences between them. So now that we have some idea about uh, how this setup is, is done to look at them in the time domain, let's change the setup a little bit so we can look at the signal in the frequency domain. But for that we're going to be using uh, a spectrum analyzer, so I will power on the spectrum analyzer and then I will uh, change uh, the input to the spectrum analyzer from this guy so I'll move the, one of these to this and then we can look at what that signal looks like in the frequency domain. So first we'll take channel 1 and connect it to uh, the spectrum analyzer so I'm going to need to move this out of the way so first let me power this off, disconnect these guys turn the power supply off as well and move this guy out of the way since we don't need it anymore and I will take this thing which allows me to convert the BNC to SMA so now I can connect this to my spectrum analyzer so I will take this guy out put this guy at the input of the spectrum analyzer like so so and uh, I already know the frequency of my crystal oscillator. I know that my, my uh, crystal, uh, which is here, is at 4 megahertz. So I will go ahead, turn the power back on, and look at my signal. To zoom in again. Here we go. So let's see what all of this is. First, every time you, got, every time you use a spectrum analyzer, the very first thing you should do is you should reset the instrument. Press the preset button and that will bring the instrument to a default state so that you don't try and figure out and correct for other people's settings. So I will preset this even though I'm the only one using this. I always preset this before every use. So when it's preset it's showing the entire frequency band. Most of it is not of interest. So I know that this crystal is at about 4 megahertz. So I'm gonna go click on frequency. I'm gonna set my starting frequency to be zero and I'm going to set my stop frequency to be multiples of uh, the crystal oscillator frequency. Let's say I look all the way up to 25 megahertz. Stop, 25 megahertz. Here we go. So I see a whole bunch of tones. In fact, let's look all the way up to 50 megahertz. And I will, if you guys have never used the spectrum analyzer, it's uh, good to learn a little bit about how to use this instrument. So right now, I'm going from 0 hertz to 50 megahertz and the resolution bandwidth is set to 300 kilohertz so I'm going to lower the resolution bandwidth so we can get a better idea of, uh, of these frequency tones click the resolution bandwidth lower it to let's say um, 100 kilohertz okay get rid of that so here we go we see a whole bunch of tones uh, all the way from the beginning to the end now it's a little bit puzzling of why we see all these tones remember this is the frequency representation of the signal we just saw on the oscilloscope. So the square wave coming from the crystal 